Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And you probably know what I'm about to say. Skyrim is a monumental game. With an expansive amount of land to explore, colossal number of characters to meet, and sizable number of quests to complete. Yes, that rhyme was by accident. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim offers so much content that nearly eight years after first entering homes and stores, even some of the most dedicated players have yet to uncover all Bethesda has built into this title. So today, we're going to keep on working to resolve such a dilemma, as we explore yet another ten tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, Part 34. Oh my god. Starting off, Ulfina is a Nordic woman living in Whiterun. She prides herself on her independence and self-sustainability. She can be found most nights working at the Bannered Mare Tavern, and is a member of the ancient Greymane clan. That said, as we've discussed in a previous video, she's having a secret affair with John Battleborn, a young Nordic man who seems to be a bit of a romantic. The problem here is, of course, that John's clan, Clan Battleborn, is in the midst of a great feud with Ulfina's clan Greymane. This dispute between their families forces the two to keep their love for one another hidden from the world, lest they be seen as pariahs amongst their peers. But, what if I were to tell you, Ulfina's lust for John may not be the darkest secret that she's harboring. You see, one potential contract the player may receive from the Dark Brotherhood sends you to kill a Noriath, a Bosper hunter who operates a meat stand at Whiterun's marketplace. Like so many of the Brotherhood's contracts, we're left to wonder who, and why, someone would want this Wood Elf dead. When you speak to him in the game, he's always polite and respectful, and he seems to be on every person in the city's good side. Well... Every person except Ulfina, because if you encounter the two together at the marketplace in the daytime, you may hear the following conversation. Ah, uh, Ulfina, how may I help you? Got any sausages? I'm cooking a special breakfast for a friend, and they're his favorite. Would your good friend be named John, by any chance? I've spied the two of you talking quite intimately. Best you forget whatever you think you saw, Elf. Such idle talk can prove hazardous to one's health. Was this proud Nord woman simply being coincidentally sarcastic, or did her statement carry a more sinister hidden meaning? We may never know. Next on our list, this one is a bit meta. But the maps we see in Skyrim's forts and castles are written by a cartographer going by the name Natali Dravarl. Curiously enough, this person bears the same surname as a cartographer of the map of Cyrodiil we see in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, who is named Natalia Dravarl. Now, it's unclear if these cartographers are simple relatives, or in fact, the same person. As Natalia could just be another way of saying Natali. And while the Skyrim map was produced in 182 of the 4th era, and the Cyrodiil map in 433 of the 3rd era, making the difference in time between the drafts literal centuries, Dravarl is most certainly an elven last name, and elves have very long lifespans. In fact, in Skyrim, during the Daedric quest, in the Mind of Madness, we meet a Bosmer who we actually got to encounter in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. He's lived that long, so clearly it's possible. No matter, the designers of both these maps at least knew each other, if not, were each other. For a third spot, we're taking a trip to the snowy lands of the Forgotten Vale. As we've discussed before, introduced with the Dragonborn DLC, the Forgotten Vale was once a great center of snow elven civilization. But following the snow elves' near extinction by pillaging Nordic armies and enslavement by the studious Dwemer city-states, the Forgotten Vale is now but a ruin of what once was. And the once majestic and beautiful snow elves that inhabited this location have been all but replaced by the disgusting and grotesque Falmer. Well, underneath the semi-frozen lake encountered early on in the Vale, on the lake's floor, the player can find a disturbing sight. A pile of dozens upon dozens of all sorts of bones, skulls, spines, rib cages, all litter the floor. Furthermore, among the remains are a number of satchels with randomized loot inside. What in Talos's name went down here? Do all these bones belong to the Falmer, or perhaps their snow elven ancestors? Is this the site of a mass grave, or perhaps a battlefield? A lack of weapons gloomily suggests the former. But, if that's the case, what killed these elves? The Forgotten Vale was undiscovered by both the Dwemer and the Nords, so it wasn't either of them. Whatever the tragic tale behind this scene may be, is a secret that the lake is keeping. Coming at number four, the Silverhand are a twisted, bandit-like organization of werewolf hunters that serve as the primary antagonists throughout the Companions' faction questline. 
While in their dungeons and occupied fortresses, the Dragonborn can find all sorts of disgusting evidence of their brutality and savagery. Suffice it to say, these are not nice people. But, interestingly, it would appear the Silver Hand has some very considerable misconceptions on what lycanthropy is, as they seem to view it as a disease rather than the curse that it is. This is because on their bodies, Silver Hand members tend to carry potions of cure disease and hawk feathers. Hawk feathers, of course, boasting cure disease as their primary effect. The Silver Hand are, of course, unique in this behavior, as members of other factions don't run around with cure disease potions and hawk feathers on their inventories. At least, not to this scale. Now, we know that lycanthropy isn't really a contagious disease the way the Silver Hand think it is, but it's in fact more of a curse distributed by Hersin, Daedric God of the Hunt. And notably, the souls of people who have lycanthropy when they die will end up going to Hersin's Plane of Oblivion, rather than Sovngarde or someplace else. This serves as a pretty big deal late on in the Companion's quest line. Suffice it to say, all those hawk feathers and cure disease potions aren't gonna do a whole lot for the Silver Hand. So they basically just murdered thousands of hawks to death for no good reason. It's pretty sad when you think about it. Halfway through at number 5, during the side quest, Unfathomable Depths, the player is sent to the dwarven ruins of Avanchenzel by a crazed Argonian who begs you to go there to return a mysterious item she calls the Lexicon. Shortly after entering this ancient Dwemer metropolis, you'll find yourself at the bottom of a large pit-like room, sharing it with a number of very unfriendly dwarven spiders. Well, towards the top of this pit is a skeleton hanging on a ledge overlooking the structure. And while at first it's easy to assume these remains belong to some unlucky explorer or some long-dead Dwemer, this scene is in fact an allusion to the 1793 William Blake novel The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, where in it, Blake describes himself in one portion of the text laying over a pit of spiders and comparing that scene to the underworld. Likewise, our bony friend is laying over a pit of mechanical spiders. Furthermore, the references to this book don't stop there. William Blake's novel constantly deals with what he calls ancient and lost knowledge. And after completing unfathomable depths, the player will be granted a new power, called Ancient Knowledge, which increases the effectiveness of Dwarven armor by 25%. So it would appear whoever at Bethesda wrote this quest was quite the literary aficionado. Sixth, this one's a bit quick. But the Illusion skillbook, Black Arts on Trial, is written by former Archmagister of the Mages Guild, Hannibal Traven. And in it, he criticizes the school of necromancy, and explains why the guild has banned its practice. But that title, Black Arts on Trial, is actually a clever reference by Bethesda to the real-life book, Darwin on Trial, written by an American law professor that, as its name implies, criticized Charles Darwin and his work regarding evolution. Even more evidence that the people at Bethesda really like reading. Next, south of Northwind Peak in the Rift, the Dragonborn will find a strange sight sitting atop of the cliffs. Two skeletons lay obviously not alive around a chest. Inside the container will be some random level jewels. We found a treasure chest! But let's be honest, by now we all know how to exploit vendors for millions, so that's not a big deal. The far more pressing matter is what killed this pair of individuals, and what were they doing? Were they perhaps moving the chest from one location to another? It's locked when you find it, so unless they knew what was inside, they probably wouldn't have thought much of it. Perhaps they were ambushed by some of the Rift's famous unhospitable wildlife. What went down? Whatever the case, they were so close, yet so far from riches. Eighth, long ago we discussed on this channel how Skyrim had a cut game mechanic that would have essentially allowed certain NPCs who died to come back as ghosts for brief periods of time to haunt NPCs they had relationships with. So for instance, say you were to kill Nazim. There was indeed going to be a chance that his spirit could come back from the dead to haunt his wife. Well, evidently, Bethesda already went through the trouble of recording some of the dialogue that victims on the receiving end of these ghostly apparitions would say. Take a listen. When my husband died, I wasn't sure I could let him go. Now I don't have to. My mother's been haunting me ever since she died. At first, it was a little strange, but now I'm glad she's here. Getting close to the end here at number 9, Redwater is a small hideaway in the Rift, located in the cellar of a ruined cottage. At first, it seems this location is little more than a well-hidden skooma den. Inside, you can find a plethora of empty skooma bottles lying on the floor, and even more unfortunately, a number of sick people coughing away in their bunks. It's a sad thing to behold, 
But should the Dragonborn be a bit snoopy, or clumsy, and sneak towards the back, you'll find that Redwater Den is actually secretly being run by vampires, who are covertly getting people hooked on their special skooma recipe in order to have them pass out, and from there feast on their blood without any resistance. At least, that's the spark notes of it. Of course, being the Dragonborn and all, you can put a stop to this charade. But among the numerous unfortunate skooma addicts you'll find in this basement will be one that you may have seen before. An NPC named Imperial Deserter can be found hacking away in his room. If you approach him, he'll reveal that he was in fact with you in Helgen, and he remembers the player distinctly. Take a look. <coughs> what? Who? You're that one from Helgen. Barely made it out of there myself. I hurt my back and I... I just need something for the pain. Unfortunately, seeing as he's already tried the skooma, it's a bit too late to rescue this man. How tragic to survive something like Helgen, only to fall victim to another ploy. And finally, last on our list, at the end of the quest, a Daedra's best friend, speaking through his shrine, Clavicus Vile will request that you murder a talking puppy named Barbus. In return, the Daedric god of bargains and trickery, sounds trustworthy, promises to allow the Dragonborn to keep a unique artifact named the Rueful Axe. Apparently, much of Clavicus's power is inside Barbus, and killing the dog, who's actually a shape-shifting Daedra, it's a long story I know, will allow him to get that power back. If you do agree to these twisted demands and slay the dog, Clavicus Vile will uphold his end of the bargain, and the axe will be yours. Now, anyone who's played through this quest before knows you don't actually have to kill the dog, but we'll get to that later. You see, if you do keep the axe, you'll find that it's actually a pretty terrible weapon. While it does a measly 22 points of damage, just barely over a Skyforge Steel Axe, it actually swings 30% slower than normal Battle Axes, which already swing pretty slow, making the Rueful Axe literally the slowest weapon in the game. Frankly, this feels like an absolutely terrible reward from a literal god. What gives? Well, there actually seems to have been quite a bit of thought put into this by Bethesda. The thing about Clavicus Vile is that in the game's lore, mortals who engage in dealings with him will almost always end up regretting it in the future. As you probably do for killing an innocent animal in exchange for a lousy axe. This is the Daedric God of Trickery we're talking about after all. Though if you refuse his request and don't kill Barbus, Clavicus will take his axe back. But reluctantly instead give you a different artifact, the Mask of Clavicus Vile which, namely, is a much more fitting reward. When worn, the mask gives you 20% better prices game-wide, effectively making you 20% richer instantly, as well as offers 10 additional points of persuasion. This piece of apparel is undeniably a much better item to have than that terrible axe. And on top of that, no puppies need to die. So what Bethesda did here that was so clever is they sort of made you regret siding with Clavicus Vile if that's the path you chose to take. At least, after finding out what the alternative would have been. So hats off to the writers. This was a pretty ingenious bit of storytelling. But with that, we are going to wrap up. Yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Part 34. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Which of the ones featured on this list were your personal favorites? Do you know any tiny details that I've yet to cover on this channel? Do you have more to add to some of the ones that I have? If so, leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.